Well, Professor Rittenauer, it's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. You're here for the Austrian Scholars Conference. I am indeed. And you teach at Grove City College, a place with a great heritage in the Austrian tradition. Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, of course, most people, uh, if they know of Grove City, know about uh, Hans Senholtz, who was there for, oh goodness, from the 1950s, I think, retired in 1992 and established a great Austrian tradition there. Yeah. How many students are at Grove City? Oh, uh, right around uh, 2,500. Okay. And most most professors complain about their students. I've never heard you complain about yours. No. No, you have not. No, I, I'm very, we're very uh, pleased. Um, uh, typically, uh, we get uh, really uh, certainly bright students, um, and the econ majors that we get are not just bright but uh, interested in economics, economics that uh, are, is relevant for the real world, economics from a praxeological, Misesian perspective, and they just they just eat it up. We have four students, uh, four economics majors here at the conference oh, with the us. So, with you. Okay. Yeah. Well, they actually, they, we didn't bring them with them. They decided they're going to have a road trip and come down themselves. When your stu- when students enter as as freshmen, or maybe when they come to you as majors, as uh, sophomores or juniors, they, are they already aware of the uh, the Misesian connections with Grove City? I would say most of them are. Yeah. Uh, not all of them. Some really don't. What they know about economics is what they learn in high school, and so uh, they come and then are surprised that economics can be this relevant and this real when you base it on human action. Uh, but a lot of them do. A lot of them uh, come to Grove City. They sort of self-select. They want to come here. I've, it's, it's often that we talk to prospective students uh, when they're still in high school. They call and ask for information about the econ program. They've heard we're Austrian. They want to know, are we really Austrian or are we just sort of Austrian in name? Yeah, funny. Interesting. Um, and the connection to Mises is interesting. Uh, Margaret, I guess, uh, gave or sold the uh, Mises' papers to Grove City. So you have a large collection of Mises' own uh, papers, the original papers. That's exactly right. Yes, we got the Mises archive that's uh, housed in the library, and it's uh, it's a treasure trove of, uh, you know, is is I, I get you know his papers that were uh, written in correspondence, primarily during his uh, time in America. Yes, right. So none of the German stuff, but which. Yeah, you know, we have all the upstairs. I sometimes take visitors, and they say that we want to see Amuses' papers before he came to the United States. And I show them what it is. And it's this tiny little old world printing. It's you right, know. right. Yes, yes. <laughs> they don't spend a lot of time. Like, it was nice to look at, but yeah. <laughs> exactly. but it was, I don't really understand it. Yeah, apparently, only Guido Holzman can read it. Yeah, is is Grove City still independent? Yes, yes, fiercely so. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, there's uh, the, the the president is giving a um, sort of a hosting an event this next week on uh, the Supreme Court case. It's sort of resolved revolved around uh, Grove City College not uh, accepting uh, government uh, grants and or student loans, so that we uh, can remain fiercely independent and not have to. Uh, not be in danger of uh, the level of uh, you know, government intervention in education that other uh, schools that take government money would be under. Now, do you have any students of, from Grove City's program who are right now in graduate school? Yes. Uh, we have um, – well, wait a minute. I don't know if we have – we have – I don't know if we have any right now. We have some that are currently applying. We just have one that just, just recently graduated uh, with a PhD from Ohio State University, uh, Lucas Engelhart. He just finished. And okay. then we've had um, a number of students that uh, have matriculated through master's programs. A lot of students that come, they, they end up in graduate school, but they go to law school. That's sort of what they, they know that they want to do when they, when they come through here. Um, so we've had a, a, a pretty large number. In fact, interestingly enough, there's a student that I think he would have majored in economics if he had discovered economics until it, until you know before he was a I think a junior in college. By that time, it was sort of too late to get all the credits in. But he subsequently went on to uh, Penn State, uh, the, the law school at Penn State, and has written a uh, law review article that got published dealing with applying uh, the 
the praxeology to inheritance law that is now in in the uh, in the legal literature. So yeah. that's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. And I, I did an independent study with him on applying praxeology to the various legal theories that are alive and kicking in the contemporary uh, legal uh, field. So it was, it was really exciting to see that sort of come to fruition. And you have some good colleagues there, Jeffrey Herbener, oh, of course. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yes. So is, is it a is it a, the sort of place that should uh, be recommended for, for people to consider for school? Oh, uh, by all means, yes. I think I think especially if you're interested in economics uh, from uh, a assessing perspective, mm-hmm. I think that not not ju- we don't just have you know a, a professor here, a professor there that sort of is interested in Austrian economics, but we have uh, people that begin their theory classes in, in principles of micro, principles of macro, foundations of economics, beginning with human action, and we just teach. Well, this is what economics is, yeah. and then we get into the I, I teach the intermediate micro and macro uh, sequence, and there we look at the broader – what is the broader uh, profession of economics? What do they think about price theory? We talk about neoclassical price theory. We talk about the, the vast number of perspectives on macroeconomics, and so we learn them all, but – we learn we learn them from uh, the we learn to evaluate them from the perspective of praxeological economics, and we don't have to try to sort of tack on a little bit of um, assessing economics to sort of band aid over this gaping wound of modern economics. We can the students come in understanding the way the economy really works. And so then when they're presented with, you know, the, the Keynesian system uh, or the monetarist system, they can immediately see, well, there, there's parts of this that just that isn't right. And you don't have to you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single class that we right. talk about. And then, of course, the myriad of uh, other electives that we teach from comparative economic systems to money and banking to um, American economic history or the history of economic thought. I mean, it's the... the, the, the the uh, the Austrian content just sort of permeates the entire curriculum. So if you're interested in assessing economics, that Grove City is a place to come for undergraduate economics. For Do you sure. people come up to you at this conference and say, uh, "Sean, you're living the dream"? Uh, not as many as should. I mean, I, I feel like it. I mean, I'm, I'm having a great time. Uh, they're paying me for doing what I love. Um, I, I we have good students. Um, things are and and Grove City is a lovely town. Yeah. It's a, it's 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 small towny. It's actually I, when I when I first got the job, I was a little bit leery. I think I'm going to Pennsylvania. It's you know, quite a bit farther east, but it really feels like a midwestern. It, you know, I for, you forget how wide Pennsylvania is. And by midwestern, you mean good. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. Midwestern in, in the in the good sense. The way like, I was brought up in the Midwest, and so uh, you know, so small towny, uh, neighborhood oriented. Hi, how you doing? Right. That kind of thing. Right. Right. Now, it wasn't too long ago that you were a graduate student at Auburn University. Yes, I remember these days well. I do too. With, with great to fondness. Go, but uh, but in, in a very quick, uh, quick, very quick period of time, you've you've already you're at Grove City, and I, I gather you're planning to stay there for a while. Yes. Yeah. I have no That's intention. That's on Hanson. Hans Enholtz did for so many years. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. He said he, you know, it was time to retire only when he was getting students saying, you didn't teach my parents, but you taught my grandparents at <laughs> economics at Grove City. So, okay, that's it. I recall that Gary North once wrote, I think it was an article, maybe it was just a speech, where he talked about the way to leave a legacy is to, is to find a place uh, where you're going to make it a permanent home for yourself. Oh, I think there's something to that because there is... There's some the, 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 there's a there's part of the academic culture where you you know there's a certain inertia, and so it takes a number of years to actually uh, have some type of vision develop. You know, I mean, because I the, the, sort of the in some sense the the re the reviving of the Austrian tradition didn't start with me. It really started in '97 when they hired Jeff Herbner. Yes, and then he contacted me, and then I came on board from. Uh, so he was there in '97. I came on board in 2001. Yeah, and then it was another two or three years before we got the Austrian Student Scholars Conference going. So you know these things just take time. And if if let's say I'm one place for four years, and somebody else for four years, and somebody else for four years, you don't have the time to really develop yeah. the um, sort of the institutional uh, momentum, I guess. And the Austrian Student Scholars Conference occurred two weeks ago. Yes. Yeah, roughly. I yeah, two three weeks. And it's ago. a kind of miniature version of this. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's it's, it's modeled after the uh, Austrian Scholars Program, uh, designed for undergraduate and uh, graduate students, and um, it's it's been fat. It's been great. This is. Yeah. I think it was the either the sixth or seventh conference we've had. It was the largest that we've had. We've had something like thirty over thirty papers, 
Um, f- and we've had we had people from uh, many different countries that uh, presented from many different uh, universities and uh, colleges. It was it's just really 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 great. And these things do have a momentum, don't they? They yes. develop a reputation sure. and. Uh, uh, start achieving a certain status, and people oh, yes. aspire to give papers there, and that Certainly. sort of thing. And standards are always going up all the time. Oh yes, yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, I've been really pleased with how it's how it's grown and developed. Well, you know, it's interesting when I think about um, about this. Uh, Twenty years ago, something like you know an Austrian student scholars conference was was inconceivable. Now it's it's. Oh, probably, I know. Yeah. It's it's like the uh, the, the industry standard. Yeah, the industry standard. That's right. Now, uh, speaking of, you have a new book. Well, it's not yes. quite new. It came out, I guess, last year. Uh, January 2010, yes. Yeah. And the title? The title is Foundations of Economics. And it's marketed mainly to a kind of private school, religious school market. Yeah, yeah. I was asked, I was sort of commissioned, if you will, by uh, a uh, successful Christian entrepreneur to write a free market uh, economics text, introductory free market text from a Christian perspective mm-hmm. that would then be uh, likely to be adopted in uh, mostly private but Christian uh, schools. High schools colleges and colleges. Basically colleges was yeah. sort of the initial vision. And so that's what I did. I wrote, I, I wrote uh, what I, I wrote a principles text. Yeah. Uh, the, the main goal is to teach students economics and then also have them understand that, that there's nothing in uh, scripture that's contradictory with good economics. Yeah. That we don't have to be sort of hold it, you know, hold it at arm's length. Say, well, this is about worldly things, right. you know, that kind of stuff. So um, it took me, you know, I think I think I was talking to somebody. It took me at least like four and a half or five years to write the oh, manuscript. But it's, it's a gigantic book. Actually. That's five hundred and sixty-four pages. Yeah. And you know, it's one of those things. If he said, if he would have said up front, said, I want you to write this book, but it has to be five hundred sixty-four pages, I would have said, No, I don't think I'm your man. <laughs> uh, but you know, as it just sort of, you just start writing, and you have this vision for what you would think a body of economics, an introductory body of economics would be, and it just sort of, the, the size sort of determines itself. And I'm not sure if I told you this, but a number of people have mentioned to me who have read it that they were impressed at the writing style oh. and um, the, at the rigor of, of, the, of the logic and uh, that uh, everybody likes it. Oh, well, uh, thank lot, you. I'm, so. I'm gratified. Yeah. Do you know how it's doing? Is it being adopted? It's being adopted some. I don't, I don't have the, um, the most up-to-date figures. I, 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 my, my, my temptation is to be sort of like the numbers hound. You know, every, every week calling, what, what are the numbers like this week? What are the what, numbers like this the week? New York Times. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. And um, uh, I, I know that I will finally have made it when I get denounced by Paul Krugman <laughs> on his blog. Well, of course, we can always dream. <laughs> That's right. But um, it, it, was doing, it was doing okay, um, I think, by, as, as of May... Um, I mean, I, I know. I mean, I use it in my classes. Uh, Dr. Herman used it in his classes. Nice. I get correspondent from other professors who uh, use it in their classes or are wanting copies of uh, our supplemental materials, like the, uh, the student study guide, the instructor's manual, and that kind of thing. And then, uh, so I, I know that it's being adopted. And I, and I do watch from time to time sort of the the Amazon, um, uh, you know, numbers. And the I think it was the day after I had a piece. Either it's the one I published at Mises.org or at uh, LouRockwell.com. Uh, my sales ranking was up uh, in the 2000s, yeah. which was fantastic. I mean, it was like I was in the top 50 popular econ texts. Okay. So for one bright, shining day, I, you know, I will always have Paris, you know. <laughs> You're probably even ahead of Paul Krugman's book. So. I was on that day. That was fantastic. That was, that was a great day. <laughs> but, um, but uh, I, you know, I, it's clear that, you know, it, 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 it's still getting sold. And I should find out again. I mean, I... I, I I just I don't like I don't want the publisher to think oh I'm the guy that always you know wants to know what the yeah. numbers so I, I sort of say I'm not going to call them I'm going to let them contact me and yeah. we'll see sure. but the the impression I get is it's selling okay and especially given the fact that I haven't had time to really market it like I would like and and they don't have the the resources to market it like they would like so I'm just sort of you know I have a have a blog and I talk to people and I've been on a few radio. Station, your radio well, program, so it's the kind of book that maybe it's not going to make a, make a big splash up front. You're, you're right, bad. sure, but it's, it's got some longevity to it. It's not exactly. tied to it's, current it's events. Not, not exactly meltdown or uh, you know nullification, but uh, <laughs> but you know it, it's, you can't it's, write a new book every six or six weeks. Not so me, <laughs> not me. Oh no. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, you you maintain a very uh, rigorous schedule too of teaching. You have oh, yeah. a lot of classes. Oh sure, yeah, we teach, I teach four courses every semester. Yeah. 
And you know, once once the semester gets going, it is just hard to find time to yeah. devote to to a pro, to writing, especially if you have to just start from scratch. But you know? teaching is your calling, right? I think so. Yeah. Although I find the two that as I've gotten older, as I've as I've taught more classes, you just sort of you learn more economics by teaching. Sure. And I'm at the point now where I do feel like I have things after I've sort of let ideas percolate and theories sort of sit for a while. I, so, I, I'm at the point now where I do feel like I have things to say yeah. that I'm ready to start, you know, m- you know, in a while, maybe start my next project. Yeah, maybe a research project and a writing, yeah. a writing project. I hope you'll consider the Mises Institute for, for that sort of thing. Well, I, I think I will. Well, there's a lot of things uh, to write and a lot of things you could write about. I mean, you're very involved in the arts, for example. Yes, yes. And there's not enough material in the economics world on that. No, topic. no. In fact, I mean, it's it's, oh, it's so frustrating. Every every time they talk about, you know, cutting something, the next thing you know is you hear these studies about how, oh, you can't cut the arts because they generate so much money for the economy, so much taxpayer dollars. Right. I'm thinking this is Keynesian multiplier all over again. You, uh, you've got a lot to and, say. Oh, it's so yeah. frustrating. And it's like, it's not like... They, it's not like economists haven't pointed this out. And it, you know, Bastiat points this, the problem with this thinking out in uh, things that are seen and not seen. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we've known this since at least, you know, the, eight, the middle of the 1800s. But right, uh, right. It's, just like, it's just like a minimum wage. You know, you just, it's like banging your head yeah, against well, the wall. Every generation has to relearn these it. truths. And, but you, I, sh- I should say that you're very qualified to speak about this. There was a time when I, I was, I recall, playing the, what, the, a piece on my car stereo that I thought was surely the most obscure piece of music ever. And you only heard a few notes. And you said, well, sure, that's a Monteverdi magical. <laughs> that's right. Do you remember this? I do remember yeah. this. So, yeah, that was, was, one, of my was, great, that was really, one of my great you know, moments. <laughs> Drove off the road. Yes, How did you that's know right. That? That's right. That's right. Yes, and you know, I, I actually ref- in my book I reference here when we talk about uh, the the not being able to compare utility. Yeah. I I have an example where uh, we two people are arguing over the, uh, the 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 musical value and the economic value of the music of uh, Heinrich Schütz. Oh yeah. And uh, I've had people. Oh, Schütz. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've had people. I've had people ask me uh, on campus. Well, is you know, w- were you talking about one of the music professors uh, on? Campus when you when you wrote this, I said, "Well, no, it's actually about a good friend of mine that I uh, met in graduate school." <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, and I should credit you also for introducing me to, to, to Beethoven, which is an embarrassing to have to admit. But when you live in the world of Monteverdi and Schutz, you know, all your life, Beethoven's a revelation. Well, you know, it's one of those things. I appreciate that, and I thank you for that. But you're right. I mean, it just it just takes time to really understand a composer and then start to you know branch out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope you bring your your two great interests actually many great interests together and and uh, but you've got many years ahead and we're looking forward to great things thank you for being with us here today professor rittenauer well thank you very much it was a it was a treat